We'll share screen. Okay, shall we get started? Very cool. So, I'm uh, going to talk about a few topics today. I'm uh, going to talk about asynchronous behavior and databases, uh, and then uh, yeah, launch into uh, project three. Um, so, last week we uh, talked a little bit about build environment stuff and how you get a uh, back end server all set up. Uh, we're going to kind of take a departure from that this week and uh, be using uh, online tools for talking about databases. Uh, and then next week, we'll come back and try and take what we learned about databases and what we learned about uh, environments uh, and put them together to uh, be able to use a database on your own server. But they're kind of two big topics uh, to uh, think about databases uh, and think about how to get one running on a server uh, are two hard things to hold and hit at the same time. Uh, so we're going to kind of take a uh, route through something equivalent to JS Fiddle, but for databases called SQL Fiddle. And we'll play a lot with, uh, with that today. I um, want to talk first of all about uh, homework eight just a little bit and make sure people are finding the resources on this stuff and what a few of the resources were. Uh, and uh, I think actually looking at my agenda, I pulled JSON introduction out of this week because I was starting to write my slides and realizing, oh gosh, that's too much. Uh, so I think we're going to go a little bit slower and talk about JSON next week and spend more time on uh, yes. databases today. <laughs> there we go. Um, so the main points out of uh, uh, homework eight that I wanted to uh, have uh, people get out of that. Uh, first of all, uh, the directories thing. I had a number of people ask, uh, well, why do you want a second directory in here? What do I want to do with this second directory? Uh, and, and in reality, nothing. Um, so, so I ask in the homework to have uh, yeah, yeah, two directories inside the GitHub folder uh, yeah, yeah, just to show that you could. Um, no, no, no. Uh, so, uh, and, and I'm glad I I'm glad I pointed it out here. Uh, then uh, that uh, basically the way that a file system is organized uh, is into uh, uh, folders uh, and uh, and files. Uh, uh, folders are the same as directories, uh, yeah. and uh, so uh, you can also have folders within your GitHub project. Uh, and so it uh, pulls down not just the files in your GitHub project, but the entire file structure of the folders and files in your GitHub project. Uh, and the reason I emphasize this is that uh, particularly as we get a server set up in a GitHub project, uh, you're going to want to have your server files and your client files in different directories uh, just to keep things organized. Uh, and in fact, usually when I'm working on a uh, larger web development project, uh, I'll have a whole tree of file structure in there. Uh, and that file structure is how I keep uh, different parts of the website separate from each other. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah. Um, it's like when you have a database, it's that's right and then you navigate down a level and you see yes. more files and folders uh, that you can take this whole structure uh, and yeah. move it into uh, your uh, your github rather than just a set of files uh, and as we get to bigger projects that becomes important because thinking about how you structure your github uh, folder uh, your github project uh, helps you keep things straight in your head as to where it is from there on down yeah exactly yeah oh, and so this is actually a way of editing and files uh, and working within a section and not getting in the way of what other people are doing when you're working as a group but uh, and so I often use folder structure as a way of going, okay, this person's going to work on this piece and this person's on this piece. Uh, and as long as you're in a folder, it's clearly separated. Uh, yeah. Oh, rats. Yep, 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 yep. <laughs> Indeed. So I often have it that one page equals one folder in my Git structure uh, because that makes it easier to break up in, uh, in pieces. Yeah. One, one page or one component, because uh, that's not often the same. Uh, uh, that if I have a nav bar, for instance, my nav bar will be in a directory, uh, and then each of my pages that have that nav bar uh, will just include it onto that page. Uh, so, uh, so one component is kind of a logical grouping that makes it on multiple pages. So on some of the resources that you guys uh, found, uh, W3Schools and MDN I keep pointing to because they're uh, basically really comprehensive and they'll have everything. And so I want you to know where everything is, but they're not the most friendly uh, way of getting a lot of this information sometimes. Uh, 
uh, I often use videos uh, and uh, tutorials. Uh, I, who, who found something that uh, I hadn't mentioned that was really helpful to them as part of this, uh, this homework? Yeah, okay, we're going to talk about that today, actually. Yeah, yeah, that's one of the things that we have some exercises on. You read my mind. There are a lot of blogs that had a lot of information about him, all this, especially with the promises. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So promises are a, a kind of new topic over the last couple of years. And so uh, blogging has just exploded over the last few years. And so uh, there's lots and lots of information on that. And sometimes the problem is actually separating the wheat from the chaff and sifting through what is really a good presentation uh, uh, more than anything. But yeah, I use blogs a lot. I actually have an RSS feed uh, that when I uh, find a blog that has something interesting, I throw it onto my feed reader. Uh, and uh, then it just kind of pops up when they write something new. And uh, so I, I probably, uh, I think my feed reader on an average day pulls up about 300 different new articles from various places. So I can't actually keep up with it, but uh, it's there to look back at. Yeah, okay. And that, that was a, a public relations Yeah. Um, and um, I understand that So I, I try not to worry about this one and try and do your work such that you don't need to do merges or rebases uh, and uh, it, it will save you endless headaches for right now. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And everything else is complex to do that until you get into a larger team and more prolonged project and uh, worrying about your history as well. You don't have to worry about it. Yep. Yep, no, you can get into pockets of, of holy shitness. Okay. <laughs> it's true. Oh, Linda's great. We used to have a UVic wide membership to Linda that uh, was uh, just fantastic. It was a one year trial, and uh, all UVic students could see anything on Linda. And uh, then they ended it and pulled it away. Yeah, and uh, that's when I kind of moved to Pluralsight because Pluralsight uh, has a bit more depth of content, but, uh, but Linda has certainly uh, got good presentation of content. Yep, yeah, you can. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. In the next run of this class, we're actually going to be, uh, I think, doing a Pearl Site Enterprise membership uh, and uh, uh, getting students access to uh, the Pearl Site Library and Code School uh, for uh, the duration of the course. Uh, just to have some more resources to go to than we had this time. Cool. Okay. Um, that's all I was looking for. Number eight is uh, having people find good resources uh, and understand that you can structure your Git projects in a, a useful way. So asynchronous JavaScript is our uh, big JavaScript topic for the night. Uh, and uh, you've actually used a callback before, uh, but I didn't, uh, I don't think, call it a callback. Uh, uh, who, who in here is familiar with the term callback? Does this make any sense to anybody? Okay. Well, not really. Uh, uh, what, what was the callback is uh, where uh, inside the markers in the, uh, the example three on the map, uh, uh, you passed in a function uh, to that uh, marker, uh, and then when uh, somebody clicked on a uh, marker, it would call that function. That's essentially a callback. Uh, Any time that you say uh, call this function when something happens, uh, it's a, uh, a callback. Uh, and um, this is uh, one way of doing asynchronous behavior uh, that uh, is a little bit different and a little bit more cumbersome, but uh, a, a little bit more basic JavaScript than our uh, promises. Uh, and then promise chains are kind of one thing that promises have led to. Uh, and then finally, we've got this async await behavior. Uh, and so we'll go through each of these in a bit more detail. But uh, one of the things that I wanted to uh, mention about this progression uh, is that uh, JavaScript is a rapidly evolving language. Uh, um, yeah, back when I started uh, playing with web development uh, early, uh, it, 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 really, but uh, mostly early 2000s. Uh, um, uh, JavaScript was a very, very different language and a much more cumbersome language. Uh, and uh, uh, it uh, has uh, really done a great process of evolution. Uh, and uh, we're seeing that continue, that uh, callbacks are really the way that you would handle asynchronicity uh, in uh, JavaScript uh, circa, you know, 2005 to 2012 or so. Uh, 
And uh, it then promises started to come in. Promises are actually in the uh, published JavaScript at this point. Uh, um, but uh, async await is actually still an ES7 change. I talked about ES6 a little bit in here. Uh, ES7 is the version of JavaScript beyond ES6 ES that uh, won't actually become an official standard in all the browsers until I think uh, 2018 or 2019 it's predicted. Uh, and so we're two versions out from current JavaScript for async await. Uh, and so we'd have to use that uh, Babel transpiler that we talked about last week to uh, yeah, uh, transpile it back down to standard JavaScript. Um, but uh, all of these are structures that are coming about uh, as people find uh, cumbersome problems with JavaScript and want to find uh, different language ways of changing those, uh, those problems to make it easier to program in. And uh, so uh, particularly with asynchronicity, which can get to uh, be uh, quite a, uh, a cumbersome area of development, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's important to uh, kind of watch the moving target of what uh, happens with, uh, with JavaScript. So I'm going to show a callback example here, uh, and this is a uh, much simplified one uh, from uh, the one that we did with the uh, 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 mapping example uh, the other day. Uh, it's here in um, JS Fiddle, uh, and um, yes, 12, good. I have nothing on HTML or uh, CSS, uh, and as, uh, so consequently nothing for a web page. It's just in JavaScript. Uh, my JavaScript, I'm just running on load because uh, I don't care where it, run, it runs. And uh, I've got a couple functions in here uh, that uh, are uh, doing interesting things. The uh, first function uh, is uh, not actually uh, initially being uh, called at all. Uh, so this is just defining a function. Uh, and if this were the only thing that were here, nothing would happen with this page. Does that make sense? That if I uh, pull out that definition, because it's a function definition, uh, that nothing would actually be running, I'd just be defining a function and never calling it. So this randomized 515 uh, a function uh, a random alert random, what it's doing uh, is uh, saying that uh, I, I, I'm gonna call my uh, function I just defined that defines a minimum value, a maximum value, and then a callback. And what I'm doing with uh, uh, that callback uh, is uh, uh, saying that uh, uh, that is what gets called with the function that is inside here at the point that it's finished. So, so yeah, go ahead. I am. Okay, good. I am. I can yeah. see myself having one people think. Yeah, no, this is a little bit, uh, a little bit twisted, actually. Uh, that, uh, <laughs> Um, uh, usually you think about uh, defining a function and calling it directly, uh, and here we're going inside out, uh, and our function uh, is uh, uh, itself calling a function that is defined in the thing that's calling it. So, so, so it almost feels circular here, and it's not quite, because the circle's not fully closed, uh, but uh, I, if uh, we were to um, look at this a little bit uh, more, and this callback uh, is just the name of a function. Remember we uh, talked a couple classes ago about uh, objects in JavaScript uh, and how uh, uh, any uh, variable uh, is uh, just an object, any function is just an object, that basically everything's an object. Uh, and uh, if uh, an object is a method, uh, then uh, you call it uh, with the uh, two parentheses and, uh, and an argument behind it, like I'm calling callback random. Uh, and so in defining this function randomize, I'm not saying what min is, I'm not saying what max is, I'm not saying what callback is, I'm just saying that three objects are being passed into uh, my randomized function. And the first two parameters are very simple. Uh, they're just numbers. That min is a number five, max is a number 15. Uh, but the third one is this complex object. Uh, and so I'm, what I'm calling randomize, passing in a function itself. Uh, and what I'm saying is that uh, in this randomized function, uh, you can call the, the function that I'm passing. And so you can think of uh, uh, this function uh, as uh, yeah, just being uh, uh, inside here. If I wanted this to be straight, uh, a, a straight code without the callback, uh, I'd put my uh, a, a random line here uh, and, um, well, this is gonna be a screwy way of doing it. Sorry, I'm gonna uh, actually do this a slightly different way uh, and say uh, random two, uh, with no parameters is, uh, well, that also won't quite work because I'd have to define it. Uh, let's uh, say outside that bracket, uh, function 
random two min max and we won't give it a callback this time. Uh, and here we'll take our same variable. Put that in there. And then we'll just return random. So we have randomize, and uh, then we have, uh, hey, why is my screen not taller? There we go. And we've got uh, random two, and we'll call that one uh, uh, 1525 for my min and my max. Uh, and um, then we'll, uh, actually because we're returning a value, uh, we'll just say, uh, alert random 1525 and so the way that this one is working let's run this uh, and we're first getting our callback version uh, and then we should be getting our 1525 version so you see how both of these pieces of code basically did the same thing in this example but we're structuring them in different ways um, that the way that we're structuring random two is much, much easier to understand uh, because there's no callback involved. Uh, when we're calling uh, alert random two, random two is simply returning a value uh, that uh, is the result of this uh, uh, random function that took min and max. What we're doing in the case of uh, randomize uh, is uh, slightly more complicated. Instead of having my uh, alert happen out here in the main loop of the uh, JavaScript, uh, I'm passing in a function that calls uh, alert with that random value, uh, and it's actually being called by the randomize function. And this is uh, important. Uh, in this case, we can do this either way uh, because the, uh, uh, the math uh, random function here uh, is taking essentially zero time. Um, because that happens basically immediately, it doesn't matter for the sake of uh, putting up that alert uh, which way we do this function. Calling it as a uh, callback function uh, uh, is, uh, is basically just the same as, uh, as not doing so. Uh, uh, if we were, uh, however, to uh, be um, uh, doing this, uh, and I'm going to break this out in a uh, little bit different fashion so you can see this uh, yet again, uh, it, I'm going to uh, call this and assign it to a variable. Um, just a temp variable, uh, and I'll put this in here. Uh, so now my uh, temp has a random number between 15 and 25 in it, uh, and uh, then I'll uh, call my alert uh, with, uh, with temp, uh, and uh, that uh, is, um, oh, I think I was just logged out of uh, my screen share session for some reason. That's weird. Sorry. Um, so now my alert uh, is uh, getting called with temp. I'm going to run it right now so you see it. And it's going to do exactly the same thing it did a minute ago. So 9. Then I've got my big value, 18. My uh, one between 15 and 25 here. Uh, if uh, I were to uh, put uh, a, uh, um, a sleep in here uh, of uh, 1,000 uh, um, to make that, uh, well, no, if I were actually to uh, put that, uh, sleep in my uh, random two function uh, uh, to make it uh, seem like this takes a long time. What's that? A uh, sleep is basically just a function that waits. And now bad things happen. Um, let's see what bad things happened. It was kind of expected that bad things would happen. Oh, wait a minute. Why have I not been able to use sleep? Because I want set time out, not sleep. Right, 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 right. Been using too many different languages lately. So 
So there's my 5 to 15. And it didn't actually wait. Why didn't it wait? Here's the uh, reason it didn't wait. My example is going to actually be a horrible one for this point is that set timeout, uh, it, it, it's uh, everything that happens on uh, the, uh, the JavaScript uh, you, you thread, uh, it, it's calling everything uh, sequentially. Uh, and that set timeout uh, is actually saying, uh, in 10 seconds, do something else. Uh, and uh, uh, so what I was trying to get it set up to do is in 10 seconds, give me back my random number. Uh, and what we were gonna see is that alert uh, it would just uh, pop up uh, uh, an undefined value or something because it hasn't given it back a random number yet. Uh, um, in this example, it's contrived, but imagine that I was uh, calling out to a database on the internet uh, and uh, that database uh, had to uh, handle a uh, 300 millisecond lag to get to the database. Uh, I uh, say it's a big database query. It takes a couple of seconds to uh, come back from the database, uh, 300 milliseconds back to my client. Uh, well, that's a couple of seconds, which is an eternity in JavaScript time. Uh, and it means that uh, it, it code's gonna have progressed by there. Right? And uh, you would either block the screen, it would all seem frozen uh, in some languages, or in JavaScript, uh, it would have just called the subsequent functions and things would have gone on. And so in this kind of delayed example, uh, you must use some asynchronous mechanism uh, so that when it comes back with its response, uh, it then takes care of the things that it would have done within that, uh, a, a, that response using that data. But if I tried to do everything synchronously, yeah, bad things would happen and it simply wouldn't work. Um, so there are a number of ways of doing this and, uh, and the uh, uh, one that I was showing here uh, is uh, just kind of the simplest uh, callback style, uh, uh, but it's not the cleanest uh, way. Um, if we uh, look back to uh, how we actually uh, did that same callback style uh, in uh, uh, the mapping example, uh, let's uh, let me actually pull that up to show you a different example of a callback. I think that was week seven, wasn't it? Maps example, maps example two. Let's go to the third one. So in this one, remember we had our uh, a, a markers here that uh, when you click on something happens in those markers. Uh, and in this case, we're pulling up the uh, David Strong building. Uh, and so the way we got that something to uh, happen in here uh, is that uh, we uh, were adding a listener uh, that uh, when that uh, marker got clicked, uh, it was to call this function. And this function uh, is essentially a, a callback uh, using a slightly more complicated syntax, but uh, the same concept as we uh, yeah, just did in the example right now is that uh, we weren't having this code run right away. This code would wait to run until the event happened. Uh, and uh, anytime you're waiting until uh, something happens, uh, that's essentially a callback me mechanism. Um, so let's look at a uh, variation of this that uses a construct called promises. This is in another fiddle here. Uh, and. Uh, Promises uh, are uh, basically uh, a, a way of doing callbacks uh, that are structured uh, in a, a way that's a little bit easier to understand. Uh, so uh, this delay uh, is uh, uh, saying uh, uh, call this function delay, uh, and the function delay uh, is saying uh, return a new promise, uh, uh, and uh, uh, that new promise is uh, going to uh, call a set, fun uh, a set timeout uh, and after that set timeout of two seconds, uh, uh, you'll uh, resolve it to uh, a success. Um, so again, we've got that complicated inside out structure right here. Uh, um, is this just immediately intuitive to anybody yet? No, okay. Now, let me walk through this complicated inside out structure again. Uh, um, that uh, 
uh, let's start by uh, looking at the delay function. Uh, and uh, so uh, to be absolutely correct, this delay function should probably have been defined before we called it. Uh, uh, that I much prefer to see uh, JavaScript where uh, the function being called uh, is uh, happening before the call to that function. Uh, in fact, it doesn't matter in JavaScript because they hoist all the function definitions to the top. Uh, um, but uh, just conceptually, it makes more sense to me to read the definition before the call to the definition. Uh, so I put this up here, uh, and uh, we're defining a new function. This new function is called delay. What happens with this new function uh, is that uh, we're returning a new promise. And this is the structure of uh, chaining that I was talking about. And this promise uh, is uh, itself uh, a, a, a function uh, that has two possible uh, return values. Uh, a resolve value and a reject value. Uh, we're not using the reject. There's no way of generating an error out of this. Uh, but we're resolving uh, to uh, return this success method uh, after two seconds. Set timeout 2,000 milliseconds uh, calls the thing in set timeout uh, after uh, two seconds. Uh, uh, and uh, so uh, basically, uh, in two seconds, uh, we're returning uh, a, a, a promise that is then resolved. Uh, and uh, promises uh, have this structure uh, where uh, they have a then function. Uh, and the then function is the callback from the, uh, the promise, essentially. Uh, and so when I'm saying uh, delay, uh, I'm saying use the promise that is returned by the delay function. And then when uh, it's called, uh, take that response and pop up an alert. And so if I instead of uh, promise uh, I wanted to uh, return that response directly, that would be something kind of interesting to look at. What's that going to show me if I just return the response? Anybody have an idea? Not quite. Yes, exactly. That because uh, the, uh, a, a, the response that's being passed here is success, uh, um, I should now uh, see uh, success being returned in my pop-up in the alert. So anything you return from that promise can be used in the function that's being called back in the, uh, the then function. Promises make some kind of little bit of muddy sense in here. We're going to look at a couple other examples, but uh, starting to understand the twisted inside out construction of promises. Yeah, okay. Yeah, in a lot of ways, it's a placeholder. Uh, that uh, the placeholder is a function, uh, and uh, so uh, you're saying that at the point that uh, it's ready, at the point that all the data is back here, uh, I call this function and do something with it. Uh, and uh, yeah, that uh, yeah, that promise uh, it uh, can go uh, unresolved. Uh, it can just kind of sit there forever. Uh, and if you never get data back, you never call your promise function. Uh, um, or it uh, can uh, be uh, rejected. Uh, it comes back and says, oh, there's an error in the database. I couldn't get that data. In which case, you won't resolve it uh, with success. You'll reject it uh, with uh, an error message. Uh, and it will call a different function, potentially. Uh, um, or it can go ahead and resolve successfully. Um, but all, uh, which of these states it falls into uh, has to wait until uh, whatever the promise is waiting on uh, finishes happening. Very much so. Uh, uh, that's kind of a long-term version of this promise. But in fact, every time you go out and get some information from a web page, uh, you might wrap it into a, a, a promise. Uh, and uh, that's where these promise chains come in. And so actually, that's the next thing to, uh, to look at on this, uh, is uh, let's look at uh, some promise chains. And I might actually, even before going to uh, my example of promise chaining, uh, it may make sense to uh, watch an example of, uh, of promise chaining here. Somebody else's example, that is. Hey, put that. Call dot and then, 
and this acts as the way of moving forward. So when this comic is finished, when it's finished reading the file, it is going to call the dot then method for you and pass in the data. The one where did we get this data blast? Here when you resolve the comic book. And so now we have this function that says, okay, when I'm finished reading the file, then do something. And here's the data. And the power behind this is that it's changeable. So you can continue to chain commerces together, each one doing something with the information and pass it along to the next. And every single one of these can be asynchronous because when you're inside a promise, well, if you return something, it's either the value you return, which is sent to the next one, or you return a promise itself, which means if you have a second promise, let's call it P2 as P1, and you define it up here as something else, you can simply return P2, and this asynchronous method can happen, and when it's finished, then the next method happens. It allows you to continue to define promises and continue to add asynchronous methods, and it allows you gracefully to go to the next step. And the best part about promises, too, is that, well, you'll notice we're not handling any errors here, but if any error occurs, it goes into this touch method which the error is passed into, and you can handle it here. Which means we have a very powerful way of saying, I want you to go through these asynchronous methods, and if there's an error in any one of them, well, we'll handle it that way. This showcases some of the incredible power of promises and a different way of handling asynchronous methods. So we're going to dive into more about promises and different implementations of them or not. Um, so, so just another way of uh, talking about that, and don't focus too much on the error handling right now. Uh, I'm going to have you do some exercises uh, that uh, you're going to basically assume get successful responses back, because error handling introduces a whole new thing uh, uh, of what happens when you get unexpected data back. But promises, one of the reasons that they're structured the way they are, uh, is like you've just said, uh, to uh, make sure that uh, you can uh, handle it when, uh, when bad things come back or things you don't expect to come back. Um, let's look now then at my example of a, uh, a chained promise, uh, and uh, it's uh, not all that much different uh, than uh, the, uh, yeah, the first one we uh, yeah, just looked at. Uh, let's uh, take the same function that should be defined before I talk about it and throw it up to the top. Uh, um, I was getting sloppy as I was writing, obviously. Um, so we're defining a delay, uh, and uh, this is uh, just exactly the same delay function as we, uh, we previously looked at. It's returning a new promise. Uh, uh, that promise is uh, returning a function that resolves a success after two seconds. Uh, and uh, down here, uh, we are uh, taking that, uh, and uh, in that first response, uh, we are uh, throwing up an alert uh, that uh, says, uh, I've got what uh, was promised. Uh, and then we're chaining another response on after that, uh, which is throwing up an alert with the data that was returned from the first uh, a, a chained response. Uh, so when I run this, uh, I'm uh, seeing uh, just exactly the same thing that happened last time. I got my promised message, and then I should immediately get a message saying 10, because that's what was returned from that first chained promise. And so what they were saying uh, in uh, the uh, um, thing we just watched uh, is, uh, Let's create a, yeah, another promise, uh, and uh, uh, we'll call this, uh, a, a, um, like he was, P2. And in P2, we do something else that uh, is uh, uh, it, it kind of uh, kind of hard, and let's call that a three-second thing. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, let's actually uh, resolve this as uh, an error. And we'll, uh, in here, uh, after we uh, uh, do this, uh, we'll uh, then um, call P2. So let's add another thing in here and say then P2. That. And because our then is not yet closed, we'll uh, close that. 
and then call our third one. And in here, uh, let's just uh, say uh, a, yeah, another alert. And let's do our uh, P2 here. Uh, let's, let's just say, yeah. Uh, and then we'll uh, return zero. And that'll be another thing to return to our third promise. And if I've done everything right, uh, we uh, should get uh, two seconds after the uh, first time. I obviously didn't do everything right. What didn't I do right? Syntax, missing after bracket after argument list. Where is that happening? That is happening there. <laughs> oh, you guys obviously looked at your screen again, didn't you? Not allowed to do that. Not, uh, not going to happen. Okay, so missing after argument list. We aren't supposed to pass anything into uh, P2, are we? No. Why is I don't want to be defining that. That's acting as if I'm defining that, isn't it? Let's take that definition out and just call that. Is that going to be happy with life? I don't know if that's going to be happy with life. We have a promise. And we have a 10. And we have an uncaught promise error. Hmm. And that was three seconds later. So our 10 happened immediately because we returned and that fell on through to the uh, data call at the end. And I screwed something up in the middle. I should probably not uh, go on any longer with my uh, on the fly example uh, and instead show you somebody who's actually thought more about uh, doing this one. And uh, so what he's gonna talk about uh, is the idea of uh, callback chaining, promise chaining, uh, and then how async await makes this easier. Uh, but again, to use async await, uh, we'll have to use the transpiler to, uh, to make this happen. And so next week, when we talk back about build environments again, uh, we'll talk about how to use a uh, transpiler. Async await, what is it, why is it, and how is it? In this demonstration, I'm using the main Babel library to get the snippy creation of reports to our browser. I'm also using JSON server to serve two endpoints, people and click. I want to HTTP request both of these endpoints to return an array of the results. First, let's look at where we came from and why async await can be helpful. In JavaScript, everything is synchronous, meaning it doesn't wait around for something that is time sensitive before proceeding to the line of the code. In the past, we dealt with asynchronous means by callbacks. In this example, I'm first requesting the people endpoint, checking if there are any errors, assigning the response to an object, and then proceeding to replace an endpoint and doing the same thing. As you can see, if we continue along these lines any further, we end up with something known as callback L, or tormentors run torment. It looks like my array of objects is returning as expected. Now let's look at one way of solving callback L with promises. Here I've created a service object with two methods for retrieving my data. I'm using the Axios library for returning the promise. Promises allow you to control your asynchronous flow in a more synchronous manner. First, I call the get details service, which returns a promise. When it resolves, then I assign the response to an object in the same key to replace this promise. Then, when that promise is resolved, I also assign a static to an object in the console logs object. Any errors during either of these promises will skip ahead to the catch method and log the error. This is definitely a much more readable approach 
in the callback method, we can easily be cleaned up a bit more by using the native promise all method, which takes an array of promises and returns it once they're all resolved. And now for the moment involving the report. Async await lets you take this idea of control asynchronous flow a step further by actually waiting for one promise to resolve before moving to the next line without being shown then in the extract. This is accomplished by a new set of keywords, which are async and await. In order for this to work, you must add the keyword async to the beginning of a function and use the await keyword inside the function. The await keyword will wait for the get people promise to resolve before running the get table promise. Once they're both complete, I return an object with the response. Notice how this method allows for me to use the built-in try catch functionality, which feels a little more natural to the language compared with the then and test method in our previous example. Um, so that's uh, a, a back again to the error handling. And error handling is uh, really an important topic that we're just kind of skipping over a little bit right now. But, but that try catch uh, format, uh, a lot of the times when your web pages have been breaking, uh, they uh, just break. And you kind of look in that developer console uh, and uh, you uh, see some red text and uh, something's just kind of broken. You go, oh, shoot, it's broken. Uh, for you as a developer, that's an absolutely fine way of doing things because you can look at the see what's broken and then fix it. Uh, um, but if you can't anticipate all the things that might break, uh, it's a really bad thing for your user because your user doesn't know to open that developer console uh, and uh, uh, they'll never get any indication and it'll just look like, uh, oh, hey, the page died, nothing happened, uh, something was supposed to happen and it didn't. Uh, and so by using a try catch, uh, you're able to uh, pop up a uh, message to your user saying, uh, something bad happened, try refreshing the page or uh, 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 try back later or uh, 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 don't run this call on Wednesdays or whatever whatever it is that you uh, have is the, uh, the information from that error that allows you to uh, help your user diagnose what it is they might have done wrong that made that error occur. So try catch blocks, I mean, even if something wrong happens, uh, uh, give me some information about that wrong thing and let me try and recover from it. Uh, uh, error handling is really a big topic and it's hard to do error handling right. And so I've been kind of skipping it and missing it so far, but uh, it's one of the big reasons for uh, doing uh, the, uh, the asynchronous uh, you know, loops in a way that can handle error handling gracefully. And async await is uh, one of the, uh, the key ways of, uh, of doing that. Assuming that you have the ability to uh, run that in uh, ES7 and uh, transpile it using uh, Babel. I think we're about to leave asynchronicity uh, until next week. Uh, uh, next week, we're going to come back and hit asynchronicity again as we start to uh, handle actual server responses from a database uh, and build your database up in uh, your project and uh, try and uh, try and get responses from it. Uh, and we'll have to come back to uh, asynchronicity in order to do that properly. Yeah. But for this week, I just wanted to kind of throw the ideas out there and get you thinking about this. Uh, a kind of inverted inside out way of doing callbacks uh, and then how a little bit simpler syntax for uh, promises uh, and then eventually async await. Uh, uh, we probably will not use async await anymore in this course. That's just kind of an indication of what's coming for JavaScript. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, when we set up our development environment, I probably will not include the ES7 extensions uh, and uh, possibly not even the ES6. There's not much we're using from there. Uh, um, but uh, this is the fancy new JavaScript way that uh, if you start to see that come up, uh, uh, you know it's basically the same concept as we've been talking about with promises. Everybody ready to jump to databases? Want a five minute break before we jump to databases? Yeah? Okay, let's take a five minute break before we jump to databases. You're missing the group. Okay. 
So I'm looking for as long as I'm one of those who's got a resources file or something different. Cool. So that's what I'm after. Okay. Oh, okay. But, um, uh, it is, yeah, okay. yeah, you're inside okay. it's a directory inside your, uh, your folder. Okay. That's fine. Okay. That's fine. Yeah, no, as long as you've got the content uh, inside files and uh, other inside folders, and we're all good. Okay. Okay. Uh, you're going to make sure that we're going to get something that you know from Even if you don't get it working, you get a similar form of something. Is the downside of recording everything is that I think half of the class are uh, voicing their attention to run away at break. <laughs> okay. Things do happen. I just hope the recording continues to work. That's right. Remember, we talked about uh, not being able to clone into the same directory twice, uh, that uh, you need to pull after uh, the first time. Um, so how, but how do I pull onto the public directory thing? So show me. Uh, I don't have an answer to that, but I'll give you an answer to that. I'm trying to make that so page up there. Yeah. So, so, so you're in LS inside your publication object. Yeah. 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 On the server. Uh, you're on the server and then it's actually a public data channel. Yeah, there. Yeah, you're in LS. You want to do this programming resource? Yeah. And so CD and the programming resource. And that's a get pull. So it is fast forward update and uh, that port file will change the whole body of the So now if you refresh your uh, page up on that, bring the input. But but uh, did the update yeah, 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 okay. yeah. so, so the thing that you, you, you yeah. grab CD back into the directory and rather than cloning, uh, you get a big hole from inside your data. So you clone the first time, every subsequent time you get a big hole. Yeah. Even when I'm doing the application there, I still have to get pull the session, like before it's done. I have to update it before I can yeah. get something. Yeah, the, the server has that way of getting the new stuff on GitHub yeah. and get pull the page. Yeah. Is that a 
wait for help before I launch into databases now? Or does that actually launch into databases? <laughs> okay. I just put main color black, and my printer should be black, right? Because it's like maybe like it's my. Uh, it, it depends. Uh, we've got the three ways of selecting CSS uh, by, uh, by a tag, by class, or by ID. And or so, by tag. By tag um, and so that's main's I not a tag. A tag is something like a paragraph or a do or uh, a uh, button. Uh, uh, the HTML tags. Yeah. Main's not an HTML tag. When do you ever bracket main? Yeah. I'm sure I read it. Okay. I don't think on that. It's not a, uh, a, a but. Um, okay, databases. Let's talk about databases. Um, there are a couple of flavors of databases that uh, you uh, need to uh, think about as you're uh, setting up your project. Uh, the first decision to make is a, a SQL versus no SQL uh, decision. Now, a SQL stands for structured query language. Uh, and NoSQL is basically anything that is uh, a, 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 a not the structured query language. Uh, they've gotten really popular more recently because you can get very, very fast access to these flat table databases. Uh, but anytime you need relational access, uh, and need things that uh, have uh, multiple tables that relate to each other, uh, you'll want to use SQL rather than a uh, NoSQL database. Um, let me ask the question, though. Uh, why use a database at all? What's a database do for you? Any guys have ideas? Yeah, that's a good thing. Uh, basically, but it's storing information. I could do it in a variable. Why would I want to use a uh, database rather than just a set of variables? Yep, that's a great way. Querying. Querying, uh, yeah, security. Yeah, uh, yeah, there are also some benefits like replication uh, or uh, yeah, backups. Uh, you can do that a lot easier in a database. Uh, uh, yeah, there's a fundamental principle uh, of uh, separation of uh, data and code. Uh, uh, that uh, your code is what runs and it's the logic behind your program. Uh, the data is the stuff that feeds it. Uh, and the more separated those are, uh, the more you can back them up and be safe and, uh, and make sure that your data, which is really the precious piece, uh, it, it stays conserved, stays replicated, stays backed up, uh, stays available. Yeah. yeah. So those are the main reasons you use a, a, a database. Um, We've got some things uh, that we'll uh, just kind of touch on today, uh, but uh, won't necessarily go into full detail. Uh, um, but uh, you may have questions come up about uh, as you uh, work on your project. Uh, schema design is the first of them, and we will play with that one a little bit today. Yeah, basically, a database schema is uh, what uh, is uh, defined as the uh, fields in a database. Um, so I might have a table for employees. An employee might have a name. They might have an employee ID. Uh, they might have a position descriptor. They might have a salary. Uh, uh, these are all attributes of an employee in my company. Yeah. And as I set up those fields on the table of all my employees, uh, that's defining the database schema. Um, a schema is really just a fancy word uh, for uh, what are the categories of data that is being stored by this database. Uh, and uh, it defines how they interrelate relate to each other uh, and what those fields are and how much they can hold. So for instance, an employee ID, uh, I might just use an integer. Uh, I don't need anything uh, yeah, more than that. Uh, but uh, a salary, uh, I might use a floating point number because maybe there are pennies in there. Uh, um, and uh, so uh, you define your fields and the field types for all of the things that can go into your database. Uh, and the more well-structured that is, the more you can optimize the queries out of that database uh, and make sure that it all works as you expect it to. Yeah. You would, but it'd be really simple. Uh, that uh, basically you can think of it as no SQL, SQL database, uh, like MongoDB yeah, or Firebase or something like that, as essentially being a flat table. Uh, and uh, so uh, you still have a schema, it's still a row of, uh, a, 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 of columns, uh, um, but it's not interrelations between tables like a schema is in SQL. Uh, the next thing on here is replication. Now, we talked uh, at the very, very start of this class uh, about. Uh, high availability uh, web servers. Uh, we talked about content delivery networks. We talked about uh, uh, ways of people all around the world accessing your information. Uh, uh, your web server is one point of failure on that, uh, but your databases are another point of failure on that. Uh, 
And so often the CDNs like Cloudflare uh, will uh, not just uh, have your, uh, your web pages replicated, your web server replicated around the world, uh, but also your databases replicated around the world. Uh, and this actually poses a problem uh, in that uh, if a, uh, a user in Taiwan uh, is accessing your web page and makes an updated entry in their uh, a, a, a field uh, and it goes into their database and you've got a user in New York trying to access at the same time, uh, they need to see that new information. Uh, and sometimes it doesn't really matter if they don't see it till the next day. Yeah, so you can use a slow replication cycle. Uh, sometimes it just needs to be immediate and they all need to be in sync all the time. Uh, in which case you'll have a lot of replication between the databases and they'll be constantly talking at the database layer uh, to keep all of their information in sync. Um, and so replication can get really complicated on databases, uh, particularly as you're talking about scaling your servers. Um, everything we're doing in this class, of course, we're just talking about one database and one server, so we won't hit that a whole lot. Uh, the last one in here on advanced database topics uh, that, uh, again, we really won't hit uh, in this class, but you should be aware that it's there, uh, is uh, databases have an advantage over just uh, variables and storing things in memory, uh, but you can do transactions. Uh, and what a transaction is, uh, is uh, think about if you were uh, working at uh, your uh, bank machine. You pull out your ATM card uh, and uh, you shove it in the bank machine, you put in your password, uh, you uh, uh, yeah, then uh, deposit some money, uh, you uh, yeah, yeah, then move some money from one account to another. Uh, and in the middle of all of that, uh, the power goes out. Boom, the bank machine's, uh, the bank machine's dead. Uh, do you think any of the things you did on that bank machine actually happened right then? Can you? Oh, yeah? Uh, it did process through. It did, okay. So their element of transactions must be at a record level. I, I presumed that it would be at a transaction level, but, but uh, yeah, well, that's kind of screwy. Yeah. Everybody that they have time out and they just do their power. They don't have time to buy multiple ones. My mom was in a store. I was at ATM pulling up money and everything died right between. I had to call the bank and their system through. Oh, wow. Then my mom's off to go store for three hours. Oh, no, what a mess. Yeah. 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 Oh, weird. Because they can't tell if you're stealing anything. I don't think legally they can prevent you. Well, they did. They Huh, how nutty. Oh, wow. Just, and wow. then it was just out for three days. And then yeah. just like his power coming back. Yeah. And then all the stores ran out of money. Yeah, okay. Well, I, I, there are obviously yeah, power outage reasons to think, think about this. I think it's a good work. I literally yeah. had just left the money and I figured it was going to go like, and all of a sudden I was like, Whoa. Gotcha, oh, yeah. Down. So the idea of transactions uh, is that multiple things sometimes happen out, uh, have, to, have to happen at once for something to be a complete transaction. Uh, and uh, so uh, let's say, yeah, let's go back to my employee example. Uh, uh, let's say I'm adding a new employee yeah, and I want to add their name, I want to add their employee number, I want to add their salary, I want to add their position. Uh, uh, all of these you might want to bundle up into one transaction to make them all happen at once. Uh, so I can't add somebody to the database with a name but no employee number, uh, that's not allowed. Uh, um, and uh, that way if I uh, get partway through there and realize, oh, I don't actually have a, uh, a position for this person, uh, uh, yeah, the whole thing rolls back and nothing happened to the database. Uh, it's this idea of being able to do thing, operations uh, in a unit uh, and roll them back in a unit. Uh, and uh, this is really useful uh, yeah, when you uh, can uh, think about things as atomic units that have to move together in order to be provably correct. Uh, and databases help you enable that as compared to working with variables that don't have a lot of these control structures in them. Yep. Right. That's right, absolutely. And the more you can bundle those into transactions with all the things that went to it into one uh, into one record in history, yeah, the easier it is to design all of that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I've talked about some of this, uh, but uh, yeah, SQL stands for structured query language. It's a relational database. Uh, uh, yeah, use it when you need multiple tables that interrelate to each other. And so my uh, employee example, uh, I might have had uh, the, uh, uh, the name, the uh, salary, the employee ID, uh, the uh, position, uh, and that position might have actually been a link to a uh, department. Uh, and so if this employee is uh, uh, in HR, uh, then uh, you've gotten a departmental table uh, that says, okay, now they have access to the employee database uh, to edit it. Uh, they've got access to the whole salary database. They've got uh, 
access to these doors in the building. Uh, um, and uh, so you'd have that HR departmental uh, table sitting next to that. Uh, uh, you might have a, a, a pension plan table sitting next to that that had all for that employee uh, uh, the details of their pension plan contributions. Uh, uh, anytime that you have these multiple tables of information uh, that relate to each other in kind of complicated ways, uh, you're really talking about a relational database or a SQL database. Uh, if, on the other hand, uh, you've got something that uh, it doesn't have these complex relations, uh, you're really talking about flat databases or NoSQL databases. Uh, MongoDB is a great example of this. Uh, uh, Redis is one I've been using a fair amount lately that's just memory mapped. Uh, so uh, it doesn't actually even exist on the disk. You just have a lot of memory in your server. Uh, and the advantage of that is that you can use database like calls to it, but it's very, very fast because it's an in memory database. Uh, um, doesn't have a lot of the backup advantages, doesn't have any of the replication advantages, uh, uh, but uh, you can uh, you swap out a more complex database uh, very easily because your code's already written to use database calls. Uh, um, so it's an optimized in memory database. Um, uh, Cloud DB, Cloud Ant, uh, Couch DB, yeah, there's a lot of flat file databases. They're kind of the flavor of the month uh, at this point, uh, but uh, they're good for really rapid access. The uh, downside of SQL databases is that uh, doing all this relational computation uh, takes a, a fair amount of processing. And uh, so uh, you really have to work at uh, a, a getting the access times down if you're using a, a, a relational database. Uh, whereas if you just want to pull back uh, 20,000 records, uh, a, a, you're going to want to do that from a flat file uh, and not have all the processing time of the relational DB in there. Um, so let's talk about some examples of uh, a, a SQL databases. Uh, this first one I'm actually going to ask you to work with on the homework this week. Uh, so uh, I, I pay some attention to, uh, to what I'm doing on this one. Uh, um, it's a, uh, a, an example in this JS fiddle uh, that's using something uh, a, a, that's uh, called WebSQL. Now, WebSQL is actually uh, uh, deprecated. Uh, so uh, in all of the versions of Chrome that you're using right now, uh, this will work. Uh, but I would not use this for any website you're developing. Uh, uh, the only reason I use the WebSQL example uh, is it's a way to begin playing with SQL on your local machine in your local browser uh, without having to install a database. Uh, and it actually really aggravates me that they've deprecated it because it makes a great example, uh, um, but I really never used it in a real application. Now, anytime I'm trying to use a database, I've got a server out there that's acting as a database. Uh, and uh, I, so I can kind of understand why they deprecated it. But you know, if all my examples go away here at some point uh, uh, yeah, with the next version of Chrome or the one after that, they might just suddenly stop working. Uh, uh, yeah, but uh, basically what I'm doing in this example uh, is uh, I've got a, a bit of HTML here. Uh, and uh, I'm adding a bit of text, there's a div, uh, I've got a button, I've got this add car uh, yeah, method, uh, and then I've got a uh, list of my, uh, yeah, my cars. Uh, and uh, it's actually storing these uh, inside local storage, uh, and uh, so in a minute after I add a couple cars, we'll go look at uh, where it's actually putting those. Uh, but uh, let's put in a couple cars, let's put in a Honda Accord, and we'll uh, put in uh, a, uh, Ford, Escort, let's put in a uh, Toyota, Crevia, just a few things to put into the uh, CARS uh, uh, database. Uh, now, if we actually want to see what's being put in there, uh, as I said, this is going into local storage, uh, and so if I open up my uh, developer console uh, and uh, I uh, go ahead and uh, look uh, for uh, application and inside application web sql i can see that uh, i've got my cars database and my cars database has a cars table in it uh, and if i click the cars table uh, i should see my three uh, cars uh, that uh, are in here uh, right now so you can see that's actually uh, stored in the uh, 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 the local database that's associated with this web page uh, and local storage is kind of like a cookie yeah, that it, uh, every time you come back to this web page will be there for it to access. Uh, so I could close this page and uh, then come back uh, if I uh, wanted to. The other thing we can see in here is in the console uh, that the way this has actually happened uh, is that uh, uh, there are these transactions that, uh, that I was talking about. Uh, and so uh, uh, executing the uh, SQL transaction for the uh, first one there uh, is uh, uh, what uh, allowed me to uh, put in my uh, first car, uh, got back a result set after uh, that. Uh, and I should have rows in that particular result set. Uh, oh, nothing was in that one, that's why. Yeah, I guess I hadn't started to uh, put things in yet. 
let's get a result uh, set later on that has some rows so we can actually look at data. Why did that happen? There we go. I finally have a result in my result set. So there's my Honda Accord. That was my uh, first one. And so this SQL transaction uh, has uh, been likely a length of one. Hmm. If we navigated down deeply enough into that, we would actually find our uh, our transaction. But uh, I don't care how uh, care to go down deeply enough. I guess. Um, in any case, uh, we have the data to show that these are happening in a transaction fashion. Uh, and after each one, it's handing us a result set that was the result of that transaction. And so my last result set should correspond uh, to uh, the uh, uh, rows that I actually see on screen with the three objects in there. And that'll have my Ford, my Honda, and uh, my uh, Toyota. Um, so one of the benefits of having this uh, in uh, database and in these transactions is that you can kind of go back and uh, look at what's happened uh, at each stage that somebody has worked with the, uh, the UI. I'm going to put this away uh, and uh, then uh, talk about the, data, uh, the uh, database code in JavaScript that allows us to uh, do this. So, uh, you'll note that this is all in the uh, body, that I'm not using any libraries. Uh, so because WebSQL is built in, uh, we can uh, just uh, access it from JavaScript directly. Yeah. And uh, so nothing is happening until I hit uh, the uh, button uh, that is add a car. Uh, and uh, so that's the first place that's, uh, yeah, that let's look. Uh, let's look at the uh, add car function here, uh, which should be, there we go, down here. So add car, uh, yeah, what's happening there uh, is uh, if I've got a database, and I should have a database already by this point, uh, that I'm getting the uh, value of the, uh, the make and I'm getting the value of the model. That's what I'm typing into these input fields. Uh, and then if my make and model are not null, uh, I'm going ahead and, uh, oh, I'm sorry, you're turned off again. Yeah. Yeah, yeah indeed, where all of you move there or something and break that wonder. Yeah. <laughs> right, it's back. Um, and so then I'm calling a transaction, and inside this transaction, uh, I'm calling this execute SQL. Uh, and uh, yeah, so here's the critical piece of, uh, of information in here, uh, that uh, I want to insert into cars the make and the model, and then these question marks are where I'm substituting the make and the model that I've just pulled out of the, uh, uh, the, the input fields and the, uh, the document. And then I'm calling output cars, um, and output cars uh, is what is actually uh, going and uh, uh, traversing uh, the uh, the database uh, and then spitting those up on screen. Uh, so again, if there's a database, uh, uh, then I'm doing a select statement to select star from cars. And these are two things we're going to look in a lot more detail at in just a minute. Uh, but uh, we've got the idea of create table, which initially created the table. Uh, the idea of insert, which puts things into the table. Uh, and the idea of select, which pulls things back out of the table. And if you remember those three SQL concepts, you'll be well on your way to uh, understanding how to interact with the, uh, the database. Uh, and we're going to go through a lot of exercises in uh, just a minute on, uh, on this. So anyways, that's the, uh, the core of uh, web SQL in the, uh, yeah, the cars example. Uh, and uh, it, it may be when we uh, come back towards the end of today's class, as I actually talk about the homework, uh, if you want me to go back through this after some of the understanding we've hit in the rest of the course, is the homework's based on this one, uh, uh, then, uh, then ask me to come back to this before we, uh, before we end today. A little bit more realistic example on uh, this one is uh, using this uh, yeah, JS Fiddle site. Uh, so JS Fiddle uh, is basically the SQL equivalent of, uh, or SQL Fiddle rather, is, is basically the SQL equivalent of JS Fiddle. Uh, so it lets you use SQL statements uh, on a website uh, and uh, create a database that it's talking to uh, and play with the insert and the uh, yeah, create table and the uh, uh, you, you select statements to get data back out of here, uh, and uh, it just lets you play without needing to actually install a database and, uh, and use it. Um, it unfortunately is painfully slow, and uh, even more so now than before I was recording, and I don't quite know why that is, uh, but uh, yeah, ouch. This is not a complicated database, I'm huh. do, 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 do. Yeah. 
I had actually hoped to have a bit of an exercise on this one, but if it doesn't fix its loading problems, then uh, that may not happen. Shit. Well, yeah, something has gone wrong. Let's, uh, well, I didn't actually want to watch the video help because that was video help on my SQL. Oh, here it is back. Okay. I just wasn't patient enough, I guess. So what I'm doing in this one uh, is uh, uh, if there is an employee's table, I'm dropping the table. Uh, a, a drop table uh, in uh, a SQL is basically just saying delete uh, a, 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 a tables uh, a, a, or any table there. There's a great XK, XKCD comic uh, about naming your uh, kid uh, yeah, yeah, drop tables uh, and uh, uh, yeah, deleting all the school records. And uh, they uh, come back saying, did you really name your kid uh, drop tables? And, oh, yeah, little Bobby tables. Uh, it's, uh, it, it, it's great. Anyways, I love XKD, XKCD. Um, but drop table uh, is uh, the way that you delete a table uh, in, uh, in, in SQL. Uh, and I'm making sure that there's not an employee's table. And then I'm creating an employee's table. Uh, and uh, then inside that employee's table, uh, here is my schema for the uh, employee's table. I'm saying that I've got an ID for uh, a, a employee that's an integer. I've got a name, which is a text field. A designation, which is a text field. A manager, which is an integer. Uh, uh, presumably an employee ID, uh, a hired on date, a salary, a commission, uh, and a department in there. And then I insert a bunch of values into this table. Uh, and it uh, doesn't really matter what the, uh, the data in here is, but they all have to conform to this schema. So they've got an employee ID, a name, uh, a, uh, a designation, a manager uh, by number, uh, a hired date, a salary. Yeah, some of them have a, a float a commission. Uh, and uh, everybody should have a department. Uh, so all the data goes uh, into there. Uh, and uh, let's uh, just kind of look at how it's coming out of there. Uh, so we've got Jackson and Hoover. And uh, if I, uh, oh, I'm not going to change it because it took so long. Um, but uh, if I edited these uh, and then re-executed, uh, it would actually change all these. Yeah, John? Databases tend to be really sticklers for the, your uh, input formats. Uh, and so uh, if you're going to do uh, uh, manipulations of the formats, it's best to do it in JavaScript before you send it to the database. Uh, uh, you can do some stuff in the database itself. And SQL allows for something called stored procedures. Uh, and stored procedures let you do operations on things as they go into the database. Uh, but they're also real performance bottlenecks. Uh, and so if you're operating on things one at a time, uh, it's much, much better to do it in your JavaScript than it is to do it in the SQL code. Um, so then what I'm doing after uh, I've uh, created the schema um, is uh, I'm pulling things out of the uh, SQL. Uh, and that's where these select statements uh, come in. Uh, so it's actually uh, pulling the data back out to show me uh, uh, by designation, uh, how many people are on each designation, uh, what their average salaries uh, are. Uh, and uh, then after that, uh, I'm uh, doing another query that uh, gives me the hired date for each of the employees that are in the, uh, the database. And so let's go through the uh, way this worked. Uh, uh, the first is uh, select designation. So uh, our uh, main uh, listing here for the first select statement uh, is the designation of that employee. Uh, and then we're uh, outputting the count of the number of people that are uh, in that designation. Uh, and uh, yeah, yeah, then we're getting an average of the salaries for those people uh, uh, from uh, eventually the uh, employees database, uh, grouping them by a, a designation and ordering them by average salary. So the CEO makes more than the managers, make more than the CPAs, make more than the engineer, make more than the sales, uh, so on down to, uh, to admins. And this complicated structure of uh, statements uh, is uh, basically uh, the uh, kind of uh, arcane language of, uh, of SQL. Uh, and uh, it's a very concise language, uh, and it's actually a very powerful language, uh, but uh, it requires you to think kind of in these nested queries uh, to actually ask the database uh, what it is that you want to, uh, you know, to get out of it. Uh, 
The second example here is actually a much simpler one uh, that uh, where I was just showing uh, everybody's uh, name and their hired date. Uh, that turns into uh, a, a just select name and hired on from employees and, and order them by hired on. So that's a very easy to understand uh, select query. Uh, the first one's a little bit more nested and complicated and introduces this count and, uh, and average concept uh, as we're, uh, we're doing that. So that's kind of what I wanted to show you for a uh, slightly more complicated example of a uh, database. Uh, uh, what uh, probably makes sense now, unless there are general questions about uh, databases, are to uh, go play with some examples for a few minutes. Uh, and uh, yeah, so SQL Zoo uh, is a uh, neat one. SQL Teaching is another alternative. Uh, um, I'm going to leave you uh, to go on your own to SQL Teaching if you want more exercises after you go through things today. Yeah. And uh, suggest that uh, today we spend uh, just maybe 10, 15 uh, yeah, minutes on uh, a SQL Zoo and uh, having you go through a couple of uh, the tutorials here, uh, uh, starting with Select Basics uh, and maybe just kind of working your way through to uh, a, a sum and count example. Uh, and don't spend too much time on these, uh, but uh, just kind of make sure you get the concepts of what Select is. And I'll pop around if uh, yeah, you guys get, uh, get stuck on anything. Not use that for styling, uh, I guess, because everything falls under it. And uh, so uh, it just it's, says that it's, it's not there. It's not there. Whether it's not there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and you're finding that when you uh, try and CSS style by that, you're not using it in your styling plan? I have used it before. Um, and what thing I think we have an uh, issue. Uh, change anything but I'll just show you here. So that should work, right? Yeah. Unless something else inside it is over an inch and uh, so uh, it shouldn't work for uh, that sort of color of the body or uh, the other thing. But so, so show me uh, actually how the page is rendering that. Um,
and change something I mean, Right, but now the uh really big order <laughs> the point at which we get to the, the psychic uh, computers, uh, we're in trouble. Oh, yeah, it's pretty good, yeah. Oh, can I just Right, well, well it's, actually, it's actually more complicated. But uh, yeah, no, it, it, uh, it, 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 And so you've got a table somewhere that uh, has the items you can type in. 
Oh, oh, because you're just making it to the point. I see. Okay. And so um, people. What's the Now, if you define the temperature all in here, variable slope is one why you can use that e for a temperature. Just because if you define mean slope, it's all that that will be available for us. Yeah, but it's what I mean. So, so the videos are a good place to start, but you really have to understand your own stuff. Uh, and uh, uh, it's better to understand the very simple pieces. And so I would uh, use all of your phones as well. I don't know if they'll be lost. I hope everybody is doing it. Well, so so again, though, I, I, I'd urge you to focus on fully understanding your ability to be talking to the best words and things like that. And so it's kind of like writing and you know, rewriting you know, your guide and your paragraph is not one of the very simple things that I just kind of understand what you're trying to do in that paragraph and I'll write that paragraph more yeah. 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 Well, okay, so you know, it's just the So, 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 Somewhere, I mean, you know, 
How are people getting along on SQL Zoo examples? Ready to uh, talk about some of them and go on and talk about other things? Yeah? Where do people get to uh, in terms of... Uh, okay, uh, SQL name, great. Um, how about you guys? How far down did you get? Okay. Okay, so you're still uh, yeah, there in the selects. Uh, selects get complicated and get uh, pushed together differently, but they're uh, not ever that complicated. Uh, um, where it starts to uh, really get uh, more tricky is in the sum and count and then the joins. And uh, so let's kind of skip ahead a little bit and uh, talk about uh, joins here for a minute. I think that's what I was doing next. Uh, let me make sure that's what I was doing next. Yeah, that's what I was doing next. So multiple tables. Uh, if you uh, only have one table in your database, uh, it's uh, really time to consider a NoSQL database rather than a relational database. Uh, there's really no advantage to using SQL for a single table uh, database. Uh, um, there's uh, something I'd like to uh, have you do more at home uh, of uh, looking uh, at uh, the joins exercises on SQL do, uh, Zoo, uh, but let's look at the uh, wiki for uh, joins for uh, just a minute. Uh, and then I'll give an example of, uh, of what the join operation is. And the join operation is one of the fundamental ways that you link multiple tables together. Uh, and so uh, this is a, a pictorial example of a, a schema. I previously showed in uh, the uh, SQL Fiddle uh, the textual version of a schema where you had a, uh, an ID as an integer and a name as a text field. Uh, this is a pictorial version of the uh, same thing and it uh, doesn't have the typing of each of these variables here, uh, but it has the names for the uh, variables. Uh, so um, the other thing that uh, should note in here uh, is uh, that uh, the primary key uh, is uh, a, 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 a indicated by PK here uh, is one of the central things you need to think about as you're doing joins because that's the field that appears in both tables uh, that allows you to make the uh, relationship between the two tables. Uh, and so let's look at uh, an example of, uh, of this. Uh, so uh, the game uh, a, a, a table here, uh, we've got uh, an ID, a, a match date, a stadium, a team one, and a team two. Uh, so some example data that we have in here uh, is that uh, a game uh, 1001 uh, happened on uh, 8th of June, 2012 in Warsaw with Poland and uh, GRE, Greece, thank you. Um, and then uh, let's tie that to uh, the, uh, 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 the goal and the team tables. And so the goal, uh, we've got uh, in this match two goals having been scored uh, uh, with a team and a player and a time uh, associated with it. Uh, but notice that that match ID uh, matches this ID uh, for the, uh, the game table. So when you're writing your queries, that's how you'll make the association between the uh, two tables is using that. Uh, and then on the uh, a, a team table, uh, uh, you've got an idea of uh, Poland, Russia, Czechoslovakia, and Greece, uh, which matches uh, it, it, this field here on team ID. Uh, and uh, so if we look back up uh, at, uh, 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 at here, uh, uh, team ID uh, on uh, goal is not uh, uh, the primary key, but it is a key that uh, it can be used to uh, link the uh, two tables. Uh, and so uh, let's uh, look the way that, uh, well, I don't actually want to do the operations. Uh, that's just more of the exercises. Uh, um, but uh, I wanted to talk about uh, how the table structures uh, work using this pictorial form. So I like that way of, uh, of presenting it. So a more full-featured uh, version of this uh, 
And I don't know that I want to uh, spend the time to go through uh, the uh, details on uh, a lot of these queries, uh, but uh, uh, finding databases that are public that you have the ability to write queries on is actually kind of hard. Uh, and uh, you have to have uh, enough data and a well enough structured uh, uh, table to uh, have it be uh, something worth writing queries against. Uh, uh, Stack Exchange uh, is uh, uh, basically uh, uh, this place of asking uh, questions. Uh, Stack Overflow is the one that I've mentioned here before, uh, but uh, all of their questions get stored in a database. Uh, and these are examples of uh, queries uh, that uh, are uh, uh, against that Stack Overflow database. Uh, and so uh, if I wanted to uh, look at the top queries that people are writing, uh, uh, how many upvotes, are, uh, let's find one that isn't a, uh, it, it tied to a user's uh, stuff, because the logged in user forms a bunch of these. Find interesting unanswered questions. Uh, we might look at that one, and uh, actually it's a really bad example because it's complicated and has inner joins and has, uh, lots of selects and tops, and uh, it, let, let me find a simpler one to look at. Uh, there was one that I had in here that I'd looked at that was, was an easier to understand one. That's not bad. Um, select the top 50 users uh, for the uh, ID um, as user link, and then uh, select a count from the posts. Uh, and uh, yeah, select uh, host ID type, user ID, answer edits, total all of these, uh, and order by total edits. Uh, so this is uh, the uh, uh, top 50 post editors uh, that uh, are uh, showing up in this query. And it wants me to type in courses, piston. I guess on the computer. There we go. I hate CAPTCHAs. CAPTCHAs just make me angry. Any computer can solve them better than I can, usually. Hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm a little bit better at those, but the ones where you read the text, or even worse, are the audio CAPTCHAs. Uh, when I've got to actually listen to it, uh, it's, uh, I hate it, hate it, hate it. Oh yeah, that's just timing based. Um, that uh, if uh, you've got uh, enough movement timing uh, to uh, be unpredictable, uh, then it, uh, it decides you're not a robot. You could, uh, but uh, its timing is going to be a bit more precise or a bit more repeatable. And uh, so sometimes you'll find that it says uh, uh, that it clears it and asks you to click again. Uh, and if it does that and it's exactly the same timing, it would declare you a robot. Uh, if there are all sorts of uh, other variables in there, uh, yeah, like you, uh, you hover over something on the way or you're a little bit shaky on your movement or something, uh, it's going to assume you're not a robot. This may have been a really bad query to run because it's being super slow. I'm having that problem a lot tonight, aren't I? Well, it's not a complicated one. I don't know that it really matters. Uh, I, uh, I just wanted to show an example on a real database. Uh, here we go, that ran quickly, good. I wonder why the other one took so long. Um, so this is uh, a, a uh, ones of uh, saying uh, number of questions per tag per month in the uh, R uh, a, a table. Uh, R is a programming language that's used for uh, statistics. Uh, and uh, so uh, I guess it's uh, because it's only got a few tags in here uh, is uh, why that one ran so quickly. Uh, uh, we've got this concept of uh, left joins on things. Uh, and uh, that's something we probably actually ought to, uh, to talk about. Uh, and so this is running by date that we're grouping by uh, a, a creation date and month uh, and then ordering by a creation date and month. And so we're uh, scrolling through here, seeing how often each of the tags were used. Um, let's talk about joins, though, because uh, that's actually uh, the, uh, the thing that uh, is uh, probably most important here. And we'll see if this is actually kind of one of the, uh, uh, the types of presentation of joins that you'd, uh, you'd seen before. Um, okay, 
So Venn diagrams are a way of thinking about, uh, about joins, and there are several types of, uh, of joins in SQL. Uh, uh, the, uh, let's take two tables. Uh, uh, we've got uh, table A on the left and table B on the, uh, the right. Uh, so we've got an ID and a name in table A and an ID and a name in uh, table B. And we want to match these uh, to make uh, joint queries across tables in several different ways. The first way we might do that uh, is uh, saying uh, select star from table A. That means select everything that's in table A. Remember table A is pirate, monkey, ninja, spaghetti. Yeah. And then inner join on uh, a, a table B. So that is getting just the intersection of table A and table B. Table B is rutabaga, pirate, Darth Vader, ninja. Table A is pirate, monkey, ninja, spaghetti. And so uh, when we're uh, selecting by, uh, uh, by name from here, uh, uh, yeah, we're going to uh, then have the intersection uh, be pirate, uh, pirate, ninja, ninja. And that's what we'll uh, get, uh, uh, get returned. Does that make sense for an inner join? On an outer join, uh, we are going to uh, be, uh, uh, yeah, so select star from table A. Again, we're getting pirate, monkey, ninja, spaghetti. Yeah. Uh, and uh, full outer join on table B. Yeah. And uh, so uh, this is uh, producing the set of all records of table A and table B with matching records on uh, both sides. Uh, and if there's no match, the missing side will contain null. So it's uh, uh, producing both tables there, basically. Yeah. But we'll see that uh, it, it, because it's uh, uh, an outer join uh, that uh, we have uh, these null values in the tables that are produced of, uh, of returned results. And then left outer join and right outer join are basically the same thing, but they're uh, doing uh, one side or the other rather than the uh, full set of, uh, of intersected tables. So left outer join uh, is uh, saying, uh, give me everything in table A, uh, um, uh, and uh, then uh, here's uh, a where table B is null is a left outer join minus that intersection. Table A, but not in table B. This is the introducing the where clause. Can do just the uh, everything but the intersection, uh, uh, where uh, table A ID is null or table B ID is null. So we pull out all the nulls and just have monkey, spaghetti, uh, rutabaga, Darth Vader. And the cross join, I don't actually know how to uh, a, 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 to, to explain very well, except that it. Uh, ends up with 16 rows of data rather than the four by four, uh, and uh, doesn't actually fit in the Venn diagram very well. It's more of a table combined than it is a, a, a join, really. That's the way to think of that one. So, yeah, matrix multiplication, John, yeah, exactly, you're right. Uh, it, it, it's all the, yeah, the variables. So uh, joins are basically the way that you take these multiple tables and decide what it is out of those tables that you actually want to have in your uh, resultant query. Yeah. And uh, it's good to think about how you'll get the data back out as you're doing your table design. Uh, and uh, so that's actually the uh, next place that I wanted to, uh, to go tonight uh, is uh, talked about uh, the multiple tables uh, and uh, now I want to uh, I uh, give a little bit of time to work on your table databases uh, so we have some time to kind of uh, look at the structure uh, you know, that you're creating uh, and what you want to pull out of it and how the query would work to pull it out of it. Uh, uh, because if tonight we can get you to the uh, point that uh, you have even just drawn on paper uh, the structure of your database through your project, uh, then uh, it'll make it a lot easier when we come to next week to actually put that into the database that you load to your web server and begin using for uh, your uh, project. So next week, uh, we're going to be uh, uh, looking at actually uh, coming off of SQL Fiddle and off of these web server uh, 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 kind of uh, approaches to SQL and loading it in and uh, having your uh, uh, web page be driven from the database. Uh, and so the goal for today is not to uh, change your web page at all. Uh, but I looked at all the Project 2 websites, even though I haven't gotten your grades back on them yet. I uh, got uh, tied up on that too much this afternoon. Uh, but uh, 
Uh, all of them uh, have uh, a, a really uh, obvious database correlation. So I talked about back-end services you could use uh, and suggested initially that people uh, either use uh, an authentication service or a database service or uh, a, uh, a, a some other back-end server that they call. Uh, and uh, all of y'all's project two is just kind of scream out for a database uh, that, uh, uh, and so if we all work on databases, we actually probably get you all to a better chance of success with Project 3 and to kind of standardize things a little bit. And so uh, what uh, I wanted to uh, have you do for the next little while here uh, is to uh, grab a sheet of paper, uh, uh, grab your Project 2 website, uh, and uh, think about what does the database that I want to populate uh, uh, my website from actually look like? Uh, uh, does it have a single big table? Uh, does it have a couple of tables that interrelate? What are the queries that I'd want to run uh, as I filled each of the places on my website? Uh, and uh, we might find that it fits into uh, a single table, in which case it might not be a SQL database. We might talk next week about uh, some of the NoSQL databases. Uh, but I think most of you probably, as you're doing your queries, will find that you want more than one table in there just to make your uh, queries work right. So what I'm looking for is a piece of paper with you drawing boxes and having boxes there, the items that would go on to that table, uh, and uh, then drawing lines between those boxes to decide what your primary keys are. Are these the keys that appear in more than one table? Uh, and then eventually, uh, after you get that drawn out, I want you to start writing queries, uh, looking at your web page uh, for how you would actually draw the items out of those tables uh, and do your select statement with whatever joins you need to fill that, uh, that query table. So let's, let's ignore security for right now, uh, and uh, mm -hmm. yeah, not even yeah. on the yeah. to log on. Uh, you can just assume that someone has security if you want. Uh, you just have to uh, look for the square on your paper to the yeah. and how someone would want you to access that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did that just a black list? Mm -hmm. or, or do you want to be able to ask questions? Of
I mean, the whole point of this, from my standpoint, is to understand how to build a bigger system of action. And uh, the idea that uh, one of them is trying to work on a project that doesn't happen. Yeah. 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 So I see a couple of things that we actually uh, your uh, user tool or an SQL. Okay. 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 Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so if you get somebody to start or the, the pre star and then we get them back and right now we have a Well this would be then fifteen minutes. Uh, 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 no, no, but it like yeah, it's like giving a search and then Yeah, 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 pretty tough. Well, I'm just thinking, oh, yeah, I think we should put that in because then that would say, like, what would it be? I guess so. That doesn't yeah, matter. The, the only out. thing we've got to show for this is the That's similar to all the that. And I mentioned it's a
you might be getting the relational stuff, but and, and so I'd say the traditional third group over there about you know, how they're connecting and actually in their sequel in the table and stuff. Um, but uh, where you're getting the more relational stuff uh, is uh, if uh, you, for instance, uh, have uh, uh, an author that has multiple uh, training manuals in there, and you raise an author uh, for how effective their training manuals are training, and uh, you want to get a query by a highly rated author uh, for manuals of this type, uh, then you start having more relational stuff. Uh, right. But, but it may actually be that uh, if you're just doing a, uh, a, a search for things that are in a class based with uh, a training manual, in fact, most people don't know what you can do with the instruction. But, but um, so, so you have to trade off kind of a bunch of areas to enable uh, uh, with uh, simplicity and flat file uh, access. Um, and, and then I want you to look at your user interface and uh, Find situations for break one or the other. And there's not a, a, another right decision. If you could make a decision, you wouldn't want to get rid of the speed system of the class structure. You can have that for one or the other. That's what you want to write the code on there. But that's, that's kind of the thing. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so that's a 
I thought it was another game. Yeah, I, I mean, at some level, you can play with that. But, yeah. 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 That's right. And And don't ask too much for a couple of lines, okay? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Three tables, so. Are you on three tables or four tables? Uh, okay.
So if you have a, uh, a, a jobs table by the column from the jobs table, uh, uh, you might have a job name, uh, you might have a, uh, a, a, a job address, uh, you might have a job Well, it could be. Um, so my default path, uh, if uh, I can't figure out the ideal structure, so I'll be able to uh, 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 If uh, I uh, am able to get uh, my query on the file, it uh, gives me all of the uh, 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 training material on which a uh, job type is factory, uh, the query level, the entry, and uh, the level of uh, the uh, then, then uh, it is, and that's my query, and it's simple. I don't have to really figure out and define it. Uh, but the only time I start to figure out the really simple the process structure here is the default. Uh, and so it may be that that's your default to start. Uh, and if you're having a hard time figuring out how to do your table structure, it's just going to be a little bit easier. Yeah, well, 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 but it's a good discussion to have because if you were uh, doing this thinking for us, uh, oh, I actually have to make this kind of query that depends on the second order of uh, effects and it depends on uh, counting jobs this user is going forward and going to see what printing is very well. Then you fall very naturally into the table. So it's, it's necessary to offer a table structure, but it's just going to give it. I'm glad that actually the rest of this exercise of writing the query is uh, becoming a feature on that uh, because it's not necessarily a simple query that you want to do. It's not just simply uh, a major simple language that you want to do. It's just like how you do it. Well, so I know SQL database don't necessarily have a primary key in it. Right. Yeah, this makes table that's not really good. Okay. Uh, and uh, so all items uh, in the SQL database uh, will have uh, applied for optional required. Uh, and if required, you can find it. Uh, you can have a flag for uh, in UC
Uh, it is. As is JavaScript and variables, by the way. Yeah. 
and so we have the three different manifestations. So we can say subject into these three different real estate properties of manifestation. And how um, we're going to get home around the mechanics that we have to use
Hey, let's talk for a few minutes before we uh, run out of time here uh, about uh, the uh, project, the project grading, and the homework. But yeah. Uh, uh, so let's talk about project three for a few minutes uh, and uh, then I want to uh, go back over the homework uh, specifically I was leaving a couple extra minutes for homework because if you want me to revisit that example uh, as we talk about homework I'm happy to uh, um, the uh, uh, the thing about project three is that uh, it's a uh, back-end project and I initially started saying that you have a choice of doing database or authentication or a couple other things and uh, I want to rescind that choice and strongly suggest you all do database is why I've been kind of pushing you down this route uh, is uh, uh, that I don't want to have to cover both authentication and databases and want to kind of minimize the things that are confusing people. Uh, um, I, I don't care though whether you uh, go down a NoSQL route or a SQL route fundamentally. Uh, because um, I will talk about both of those in more detail as we uh, come into the next class. Uh, um, seems like most folks are going a SQL route, which I think is actually probably the easiest to get used to and the most broadly applicable skill. Uh, so uh, that's great. And uh, it may be even if you go no SQL that you end up doing SQL with only one table and just accepting the inefficiencies that it might not be the way you'd actually implement it. Uh, um, but uh, I think you're all getting along uh, pretty well on that. On that. Um, at the end of project three, you're all going to do a demo. So in project two, uh, I just kind of skipped the demo step. We did it on project one, and uh, I, I didn't want to have too many uh, demos, and it kind of uh, turned into a slow thing, and uh, needed to get more information taught. But uh, at the end of project three, uh, the way that I've done this in the past that's been pretty uh, useful uh, is to uh, actually think of it as your pitch of the project. So you're going in front of an investor again, kind of like you were in project one, and actually show them the demo that you want them to fund. Uh, and uh, it doesn't mean it all has to work. Uh, I, uh, there's so much smoke and mirrors and demos, it's unbelievable. Uh, but uh, a path of it has to work. Uh, and uh, so uh, if you're showing me, uh, a, a let's buy a book path, uh, uh, you'd uh, have one book that was rigged up to work, but you'd get it off a list that populated from a database uh, uh, or uh, one item in your, uh, your, your sales site. So the, the database filling has to be real. Uh, uh, but uh, the uh, one that you pull up could be the only one that comes up with a valid picture and whatever else you want. Uh, you only have to rig up, uh, pick up everything except for the initial call. What I'm looking for, though, uh, in uh, a, a Project 3 uh, is that there is a valid back end. And so some part of it has to be really populated from a database. Uh, and that's why we're doing all the table discussions uh, yeah, yeah, here and now. So the grading on this, uh, it's going to be 15 points total on the thing. Uh, 
uh, there won't be any late assignments for project three. I was able to uh, decide a little bit uh, with, uh, with the group on project two uh, because there wasn't a presentation component to it. Uh, but because there's a presentation component, uh, we actually don't really have any way of presenting in front of your peers if you're not here to present in front of your peers. And so uh, if somebody's horribly ill and uh, you can't have somebody present or something else, you can send me a video and get part of the marks back and stuff. But uh, uh, boy, try and really make it to present because uh, the presentation is five points of the uh, uh, the 15 uh, in there. Uh, uh, the uh, other uh, five points is database design and function. Do things actually work? And so what we're doing now on table design today is a big part of the database design. Uh, um, and uh, you know, what's the structure like? Any problems you ran into? How is connecting in the front end? Uh, we'll talk about how you actually tie in to populate lists to it uh, uh, next week. Uh, and then uh, code quality and robustness is uh, uh, forming part of the evaluation criteria for this one. Uh, and uh, what I mean by this is not that everything works. Uh, you can have things that don't work, uh, but I want them to not work and not do anything rather than uh, link to the UVic homepage or, uh, or crash and send the whole website burning to the ground. Uh, um, so uh, yeah, those things that do, uh, that are there and do something should work. Uh, and you should have well commented code that's checked in and uh, in GitHub and uh, just all the things we've been talking about throughout the term about uh, good uh, code organization and quality and working in a, uh, in a group. Uh, and that's basically it. Uh, so as long as you have a database, you're pulling things from a database to your web page that you have to project to, uh, and you've got it checked in and can tell a good story about how it flows, uh, then uh, you all should get perfect marks on the thing. Any questions on uh, project uh, three? Okay. Cool, good. That's the right answer. <laughs> so uh, the last thing I wanted to uh, uh, talk about in here then uh, is uh, uh, the uh, yeah, homework. Uh, and uh, this is primarily uh, to uh, have a, an excuse to go back and look at my demo example if you all uh, want me to. Uh, um, I'm going to have you take the uh, cars example. This was the web SQL example in the local database uh, and modify it. So instead of holding cars, uh, it's holding place names and latitude longitude points in a uh, local database. Uh, and uh, so you'll change uh, the, uh, the make to place uh, and uh, uh, the uh, model uh, to latitude and add another field for uh, uh, longitude. Uh, and every time you add one of those, you'll add it to the list and show the, uh, the place latitude and longitude. Uh, but I'm gonna ask you to take some of your project from week seven uh, where you're adding markers uh, to uh, the, uh, the map. Uh, and uh, dynamically add markers from your database list uh, so that they show up on the, uh, in the map for you. And so that's the main thing that's, uh, that's in this project. And uh, you've written most of the code before, uh, so uh, it's just a case of adapting it. Uh, um, the the uh, extra special bonus problem in here, uh, uh, and uh, this is just because it's neat. Uh, I, I had to work on a project for a bus locator app and uh, I, I got all into the Haversine equation. Uh, the Haversine equation is uh, what uh, is uh, regulating what a degree of latitude is in terms of meters uh, based on uh, where you are on the, uh, the globe. Uh, and so it's this neat interrelationship of, uh, uh, of latitude and, uh, and globe width. And, uh, and uh, so a degree of, uh, of latitude uh, is, uh, is different. Uh, wait a minute. A degree of longitude is different, isn't it? A degree of longitude is different and latitude is the same. Um, this, this is why uh, in uh, the, uh, the, 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 the 1600s, uh, they uh, had this big thing about getting accurate clocks on ships uh, because they could uh, calculate latitude from the sun, uh, but longitude was based on time because it always changed. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't a fixed amount. Anyways, the Haversine formula is what regulates that. Uh, and that's the uh, cool math-based way of getting extra points on this. Uh, the uh, uh, less cool prosaic way of getting extra points on this is uh, there's actually a Google uh, Maps uh, a function you can call to uh, to get this, and so you can dig through and find that if you want. Um, is that clear on the database or on the uh, question, or do you want me to look back at the code and point at things about how you would modify it a little bit? Yeah. 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 Okay. Let me uh, hop in and do that then. Uh, this was here, and somewhere here I had my car example. No, nope, that's my randomized example. That's my maps example. Uh, 
Might come back to that in a moment. And my cars example. Okay, so uh, the HTML changes, uh, I, I'm quite confident you can uh, uh, change those at this point, changing labels and adding other input fields. And uh, instead of car making, car model, uh, you'll be place and latitude and longitude for uh, your input fields. Uh, um, but uh, here actually in the uh, code, uh, you're gonna uh, change the name of it to uh, locations DB or something, uh, uh, change the, uh, uh, the title on the thing, uh, you can still leave uh, the uh, the size of it. Uh, you won't exceed one meg, uh, so uh, so that's fine. Uh, you're going to create a table uh, that uh, has, um, um, if you want a primary key, leave that ID the same. It was just being generated automatically, anyways. Uh, uh, but then have a uh, text field for place and a uh, a, a number field uh, or an integer field. Uh, actually, I guess it'd be a float field because uh, you've got a decimal point in your uh, latitude and longitude. Uh, so a float field for latitude, a float field for longitude. <coughs> um, you'll change a little bit of this stuff, but not much. Uh, um, basically, just to, uh, if you even want to leave the function name car list, you can. Uh, but uh, uh, just to match whatever you change, uh, you make your HTML IDs uh, are the only thing you'll uh, do in populating it. Uh, um, so all this logic actually stays the same. Uh, uh, a, a delete car, you might change the name of it to delete place or something, uh, but that doesn't really matter as, uh, as much. Uh, um, you'll still select a star from, uh, from places and show the whole list of places here. Uh, and uh, then uh, each time you get uh, a um, one added, so inside your add car, which will become now add uh, place, uh, uh, instead of uh, uh, just adding it to, uh, uh, to MySQL in here, uh, if you've got a place and a latitude and a longitude, uh, you'll add it into uh, uh, to SQL, uh, and then after adding it into uh, uh, SQL, uh, you'll create a function here uh, that's uh, uh, called add to map or uh, something like that. Uh, and uh, then that add to map function uh, is uh, going to uh, do just exactly what we uh, had over here, and you'll have to add your map piece to uh, uh, this project as well. Uh, um, but just exactly what we did over here of uh, uh, creating a new marker uh, uh, that's a new Google Maps marker, uh, positioning it at the latitude and longitude that's drawn from the database, uh, and uh, putting it on the, uh, the map. Uh, and I don't actually care if you add the listeners, so you can avoid all the add listener stuff for, uh, for this one if you want. I just want the new marker to be on there as to where the place was, uh, and uh, that's, that's just fine for that. So that hopefully gives a little bit better idea of what I'm, uh, what I'm asking for in, uh, in this project. Any specific questions about, uh, about the homework? No, people feeling? Okay, yeah, about uh, floundering away and asking on Slack when there's problems, and uh, this 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 is one of the more challenging ones because I'm integrating from some previous homework. So, but uh, I, I uh, expect great things. Cool. Well, thanks a lot.